Blog Talk Radio. You're tuned in to N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in-depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in 3, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1. Greetings, and welcome to Quantum Healing with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Craw Goldman. This program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world, and its foundation is based upon the late, great Dolores Cannon's work. So thank you, Dolores, for continuing to be here with us. And also thanks to Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling at N5D.com for making this show possible. With humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that consciousness plays in shaping both our individual and our collective reality, we have plenty of subject material. I am a full-time practitioner of Dolores' hypnosis method and had the honor and privilege of working with and alongside of that great lady for several years. You can find out more about my practice at newearthjourney.com. And before we get started tonight, for those of you looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, you may find these wonderful people at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. And also, if you'd like to participate live on the show tonight, please call in. The U.S. number is 646-716-8890. That's 646-716-8890. And we'll try to answer as many calls as possible. So tonight is October 30th, 2015. And happy Halloween. I am so excited about tonight's show. I have a lovely woman and friend and fellow practitioner joining me today. Her name is Alba Weinman. Alba Weinman was born in Havana, Cuba. And she came to the United States shortly after Fidel Castro took control of the country in 1959. She grew up in Fort Lee, New Jersey, <clears throat> excuse me, viewing the New York City skyline from her bedroom window. And after finishing high school, she moved to Miami, Florida, where she lives now. She's worked in the telecommunications field for 35 years and is always finding creative ways to use information and technology to, perf- to improve her life and business. And the most unconventional technology she uses now is automatic writing, which I need to talk to her about, <laughs> a practice in which her guides and spiritual teachers communicate with her via a pen and paper. To put these teachings to good use, she founded Hopes and Achievements, Inc., and has been doing life coaching. And although this was very satisfying, She longed to reach into clients' souls and help them from there. And that's where QHHT, Quantum Healing Hypnosis, Dolores Cannon's method, came in. And it was the next logical step for Alba. Whenever Alba does anything, she puts her heart and soul into it. And this was the case when she began to build a haunted cemetery in front of her house each year for Halloween. She used her imagination, creativity, technology, and the law of traction to create a bigger and better destination for neighborhood trick-or-treaters each year. And perhaps many of you are seeing some of those pictures scroll on the computer screen right now. Alba is fluent (coughs) in English and Spanish and practices QHHT in Miami, Florida. She has a YouTube channel under her name where you can view some of her hypnosis Sessions. And I want to extend a very warm welcome to my dear friend, Alba. Hi, Alba. Hi, Candace. <laughs> there you are. That was a I long am. intro. I know. I've got a little uh, 
tickle in my throat. There, it's raining here in Kansas, and I think it stirred up some mold. So pardon me for that. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. That's really wonderful. Well, let's start with how you found Dolores. How did you learn about Dolores? How did you discover her? How did you get into this work? Uh, it was a long journey, Candace. A really long journey. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that maybe our generation isn't isn't as quick to 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 find out about this stuff, and uh, it took uh, many many years to get to where I am right now. Should I start with the beginning? Well, sure. That's where Dolores <laughs> says is always the smart place to start. That's right. Well, it all started with my spirituality and and finding out about it. And it it came in a very unconventional way. Um, It all started with a makeup sponge, Um, believe it or not. Um, I I was one day, um, I was living with my mom at the time. I had just gotten divorced and uh, I used to use this makeup sponge. And one day the makeup sponge disappeared. And it was, you know, okay, it, you know, things happen, they fall. and But days later, the makeup sponge ends up um, right at the end, edge of my bed. And I had made that bed like every day. And all of a sudden, this makeup sponge is there. And I said, this is really weird. It's almost like somebody's trying to get my attention. And that's where the spirituality started. This is back in 1988. And uh, I knew that somebody had placed that makeup sponge there, but I couldn't figure out how it happened. So I got interested in spirituality, and I discovered Shirley McLean. And uh, at that time, she had written a book called Out on a Limb, which talked about spirituality, which was a new topic for me. You know, it, it, we had talked about it when I was younger, but I really um, didn't get into it. And that then led me to the Ruth Montgomery books. And Ruth Montgomery was a woman who wrote many books uh, via automatic writing. And that really, really interested me. I said, wow, you know, if I knew how to do automatic writing, I could figure out where this makeup sponge came from. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) you know, I could talk to the spirits and find out, you know, what they're trying to tell me. And lo and behold, at that time, a friend of mine uh, says to me, hey, I'm going to go to a meeting tonight would you like to come with me? And I went, sure. You know, I had nothing else to do. And it was about transcendental meditation. And I was not a very spiritual person. I I definitely wasn't into meditation. And I sat through the whole presentation rolling my eyes. Um, This is not for me. I was a very very, uh, corporate person at the time, a very straight-up corporate person. um, And and meditation was not, not part of my life at the time. And I went to the meeting, and uh, my friend said to me, let's sign up, you know, and just learn how to do this. And I said, okay, you know, just to to please them. And when I got to the meeting, they, they taught us how to do the OM and, and relax. And, and instead of meditating, my head started going around in circles, which is really strange. And... Um, and I felt like my whole soul was leaving me through my feet. And and I thought that was really weird. So I, I looked around, I opened my eyes, and no one else seemed to have their head spinning. You know, I was the only one that had these weird things happening. So um, I said, this is not for me, but let me let me go home. I'm going to try it maybe in the, in the comfort of my own home. So when I got to, the, to my uh, room, I put out a pad of, on my lap and I had a pen and I said let me try the meditation technique that I just learned and let me just hold my pen here maybe I could do the Ruth Montgomery thing and I didn't think it was going to work but as I was there uh, um, just meditating just relaxing my hand started moving and it was going crazy it was uh, you know it was all over the paper and um, hmm. I was kind of scared. I was spooked. It was like, what is this <laughs> moving my hand? <laughs> and I was afraid to open my eyes. And so finally I opened them, and it had all over the paper in Spanish. It said, 
yo soy tu padre, yo soy tu padre, yo soy tu padre, which means, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little uh, attached here. It said, I'm, I am your father. Oh. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm almost crying. So my mm. dad had communicated with, with me at the time, and I went, wow, you know, this is really great. So um, I ran into my mom's room. It was like 11 o'clock at night, and I woke her up, and I said, dad communicated with me. You know, and this is what I did. <laughs> she was very, you know. And uh, how did she take the, that? She, it was like normal. She took it like, okay, you learned a new thing. <laughs> and in the morning, I explained wow. to her. I explained to her, you know, mom, this is all I did. I relaxed. I put the pad down. I put the pen. I asked for some sort of communication, and dad came through, and I went to work, right. So when I get home that afternoon, my mom says, guess what? <laughs> I communicated with your dad today. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I said, that's no fear. I had to pay $300 for my session. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. You know? <clears throat> Alba, how so, long had it been since your father had passed? My dad had passed nine years before. And that's when I found out. My dad was a prankster. And my dad loved to play tricks on people. And i that's how I found out that it was my dad. I asked him. I said, was that you? And he goes, of course it was me, you know, because he liked to play jokes on people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, so both my mom and I were communicating with him. Then my sister joined in, and, and she started uh, also doing automatic writing. So all of us were communicating with him. And uh, I found out, you know, how he passed and, what happened after he he went to the other side, and it was a really beautiful experience. And um, you know, I got to know a lot about spirituality from my dad. Mm-hmm. But then after a while, um, we kind of ran out of things to talk about, you know, because my dad told me <laughs> that he had to he, he had to go to school. He told me I have to go to school, and I and I kept thinking school, you know. <laughs> you you don't have a body? <laughs> what, what are you talking about, school? And he goes, I have classes that I have to go to. And I didn't know at that time that, yeah, you do go to classes. So mm-hmm. he says, you know, I, um, I'm i going to let you talk to your guide now, and he'll he'll answer all your questions. So I spent many years then communicating with my guides. And my guide was like my best friend. Anytime I had a question or I had um any problem, I would start writing. And my guide told me, you know, well, you know, he, he, he kind of comforted me. Um, mm-hmm. he, he didn't tell me what to do. He just comforted me and would tell me things are going to be okay, or, you know. And it was like having someone to just talk to that would answer my questions. But I found out a lot about spirituality through him. And um, so that's how I became uh, that's how I did the automatic writing and and throughout the years the it it began to increase more and more to where I started getting guides that were master teachers that would really teach me things that I never even knew existed and they always told me they always told me we are preparing you you're a messenger of hope and we are preparing you for something really big and I kept saying well you know why me Why, why did you pick me you know and they said, you you agree to this. And they said, one day you're going to be um, meeting with people face-to-face. You're going to be helping them, and we are preparing you. And wow. it's been a long journey. It's been a really long journey. So, you know, this has been going on for years and years. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's why I started the coaching uh, business where I said, you know, I, I've been told that I need to – uh, the lessons that I'm learning, I need to tell other people about it. So I started coaching people, and again, they mm-hmm. were telling me, um, you're not going to be able to do this over the phone. You have to do it in person. You're going to be sitting across yeah. from someone and doing it. And we're talking about them telling me this back in 2007, and I had no idea that I would be getting into QHHT. Um mm-hmm. And and the reason I got into it was that um, even though coaching was really exciting and I enjoyed it, I, I felt that I felt that I was not being uh, honest with my clients because 
I, I didn't tell them where I was getting the information from. You know, I just, you know, sounded like a very wise person. But what was happening is during my coaching sessions, I was channeling. And I never really revealed my spiritual side to them. I, you know, I was you always the corporate person. You see, I was always corporate and, and uh, didn't think that people would understand about my automatic writing or, or my spirituality. And so I kind of kept, kept that hidden for many, many years until finally it, it had to come out. And it did. So... That's kind of and like so that's how a you, long story. That, that's how you ended up finding out about Dolores and QHHT? I mean, how, how did no, you actually no. get into one okay. of her classes? <laughs> <laughs> but still, it's a long story. <laughs> are, you, are you ready for this? Sure. Everybody yeah. likes stories about Dolores and how people found okay. her and how they got into well, this work. It's, it's why we're here. It was, it was really a strange, strange way uh, that I got through this. Um, back in 2009, uh, we had a, a really strange thing happen to our family, and uh, really strange. My, my son was arrested for something he didn't do, and um, that became international news. It was a really, really hard thing to go through. And wow. during the during the arrest, well, he wasn't arrested in the house. He was arrested somewhere else. But during the um, search in my house, part of the evidence that they took were my automatic writings. You're kidding. And <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, wow. They they took my automatic writing, and I had been keeping those a secret forever. And um, I didn't think people were ready for. For, for that information, so I kept them a secret. And during the search where they took everything that was important to us, um, they took my automatic writing, and I had to, for the first time in public, tell someone that I did this. I had to tell his attorney that, listen, you know, now the public, um, the public has this. This is, you know, it's going to be used you know, against me because I wrote something in in my journals about why he was arrested, you know, the, the, the whole idea of why he was arrested. And it was going to come up, and I was afraid of that. And it, that was the first time I actually had to go public with, with the fact that I did automatic writing. And um, I kept begging, you know, my attorney to please try to get these back because first of all, they were they were not only my automatic writings, but they were my journals, my diary, um, my notes on anything that I did as far as coaching. You know, it was everything that I ever wrote they had. And um it was it was really amazing. So um that was a hard pill to swallow. And throughout the Well I guess time, that's <laughs> that's really personal yeah. stuff. I mean, that's amazingly it was very personal. personal. So, yeah, so I was dealing with the fact that my son was arrested and um, vilified by the media um, for something he didn't do, and it was international news. And at the same time, I had I had this to deal with too, which was my own personal stuff. And months went by, and I begged my attorney to try to get them back. And they said, no, uh, actually, they've been purchased by the local newspaper. And now the not only do the attorneys have it, but our local newspaper reporter has it. And they're reading your journal. It, did, you say per, <laughs> did you say purchased? They had purchased it, yes. They were public record. My, 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 uh, all my stuff became public record. So they actually purchased wow. it. Yeah, so um, here I was now dealing with this issue with my son and dealing with the fact that now my entire life was being read by every attorney, the state attorney's office, and our local newspaper reporter. And they were trying to look for stuff in there to use against my son. And um, I kept doing my automatic writing, and, and my guides kept telling me, don't worry about it. This is exactly what's supposed to happen. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> of, course, of course it was. <laughs> You're nuts. I'm dying here, you know. 
it was it was like a knife going through me and they said no the people who are reading your automatic writing are supposed to be reading them and i said that's personal you know this stuff is personal you mm-hmm. wrote it to me you didn't read it yeah. for everybody in the world to read and yeah. um you know, it put me in the hospital twice. You know, I was under major, major uh, stress. And mm-hmm. my guides kept telling me, keep writing, keep writing, because um, we have a lot to tell you. And I kept saying, yeah, but I want my journals back. You know, those are private. Why are people reading this? And they said, they kept saying, they're supposed to read it. They're supposed to read it. We are all one. And whatever you go through, everybody goes through. And that was really hard for me, you know, to realize mm-hmm. that. So, the, so, you know, my guides kept telling me, you must forgive them. You must forgive them. That's the only way. And I kept saying, you know, it's, it's impossible. How am I going to forgive? Because this is such a hard thing to forgive. I'm dealing with, um, you know, thousands of people, uh, you know, saying that my son is guilty. And now at the same time I'm dealing with this. You know, how can I forgive anybody for doing this to us? And my guides kept saying, you must forgive. You must forgive them. So um, finally, I was able to forgive um, forgive them for not knowing any better, okay? When you forgive someone, you don't forgive the event, but you forgive the person so that you can stop hurting Mm -hmm. and that was a major major lesson for me was that Mm -hmm. it was you can never change the event but you can stop hurting inside by you know by forgiving them you know they didn't know Mm -hmm. any better and they kept telling me put yourself in their shoes they didn't know Mm -hmm. they didn't know so um you, you must forgive and, boy, it took me months and months and months until finally I did forgive them. And um, it felt like a big load was off of me. But I still had PTSD. You know, I, I was still suffering from PTSD because it was a major issue that had happened. And um, mm-hmm. that's where I was. And so my son's uh, case ended up falling apart. They they realized that uh, he didn't do what they said that he did. He was exonerated. He left for college, and I said, "Okay, now I have to start my my life again. I have, to, you know, now I've forgiven them. This is behind me now. I got to do something to change my life." So I got into kickboxing, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> "I said, okay. what what better way? What better way to get all of that anger that I still had <laughs> than to?" That wasn't gone from the forgiveness. What better way was it to punch it out, you know, and kick it out? So I got into kickboxing. And wow. every mm-hmm. time I would go to kickboxing, I would just punch and punch and punch the bag and kick it. And I finally got all of the anger out. And I felt like I had healed myself. You know, it, it was a, an amazing, amazing thing that I went through. So... Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing the kickboxing, and all of a sudden, I got tendonitis, and I couldn't do my punching. I couldn't do my push-ups. I couldn't do anything in kickboxing because I had this severe tendonitis. And I kept saying to myself, I've got to get back to the gym because I really enjoy it. Well, when I said that, I hurt my knee, okay? Okay. And now I had tendonitis, and my knee was out of whack. And I kept saying, well, when I fix the tendonitis in the knee, I'm going to go back to the gym. And I tripped over my dog, sprained my wrist, (laughs) and broke my toe. (laughs) Okay, Alba, Alba, I have to ask you, which side of your body? Did you do this all on one side of your body or both sides? No, it 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 was first started on the right, and then it was the left. So, yeah, I, I, I understand where you're going with this. So here I am icing all of this, and I said, you guys are going to kill me. What are you trying to tell me? You know? And mm-hmm. I said, so I'm icing everything, and I pulled up my laptop, 
<clears throat> and I discovered Dolores. <laughs> oh, so oh, you got you got smacked down into your chair so that you could do some surfing. Surfing, some serious surfing. And once I saw that, I went, "Oh my God, you guys almost killed me!" Just to get my attention, and I could hear them laughing. You know. <laughs> I could hear them laughing, right. and I said, this is mm-hmm. what you wanted me to see. And I went, this is exactly what I was looking for. This not mm-hmm. only deals with my automatic writing, because I've already been in touch with my guides. Mm-hmm. This helps with my coaching, because I'll be coaching people before I even you know, put them in trance. Mm-hmm. And everything that I ever was looking for was exactly what QHHT was was going to give me. Mm-hmm. So if I, I wasn't even, I don't think I had even finished my ice bag yet. <laughs> I had already ordered <laughs> all of the books. <laughs> I, had, I had ordered the books that were the prerequisites for the course, and um, I had ordered the course already. And during... Um, during New Year's Eve, starting 2014, I was I was listening to my course online, listening to Dolores, and on another screen, I was putting together my website for QHHT. <laughs> so as soon as I got my, um, I finished with the test, and I knew that I had passed my test, I launched my website. Wow, Alba, you know. I, it seems like I've known you for longer and that you've been practicing for much longer than that. This, you know, it's kind of amazing that um, I would not have guessed that. I would have thought that you'd been around a little longer than that. <laughs> it it seems just like went it. Right to and, the, and, the, yeah. and the funny thing is, is I, I only do my, my uh, QHHT on the weekends because I have a full-time job. Mm-hmm. But I pack so many sessions into a weekend. And mm-hmm. I get so involved with them that I feel like I have been doing this for years and years and years. Um, well, you're you know? you're very prolific, and there's so many sessions that we want to talk about tonight. But why don't we start um, a little bit with your history of Halloween because that's that's why you're here. You you posted that's a session right. on. Uh, on the forum, and when I say the forum, um, Dolores Cannon's original support forum, we, we share session um, stories and tidbits and things that happen, um, the practitioners yeah. of her method, and she posted a story about a haunted house, and then <laughs> when I was talking to her a little bit about it, she was telling me about how she'd always decorated for Halloween, and that's when I said, well, this is perfect. You're going to have to come on and tell us about <laughs> all of that. And the things that you learn, and about um, about this session, uh, amongst others. So, but why don't you start with how you came to be that amazing person in the neighborhood who decorated up their house like that, <laughs> the and, Halloween and queen. thrilled, yeah, thrilled all the children, and and uh, you really, you really went and made quite a production every year. How did you get started uh, in that? Well, when I was younger, I loved Halloween. It was great. We we grew up in I grew up in the '60s, and Halloween was going out trick or treating. And my mother was a seamstress, and she would sew my outfits. And we were very creative. I I loved the creativity of Halloween. I loved the fact mm-hmm. that you can say, you know, how the kids say, you know, what are you going to be for Halloween? It's it's <laughs> always what are you going to be? It's it's creativity, right? Yeah. So when my son was born, I had heard in the neighborhood, and there was, you know, those whisperings in the neighborhood saying, you know, there's a bunch of people that are trying to get rid of Halloween in this neighborhood. They would prefer that the kids go to the mall. And my yeah. son was tiny, and I went, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You know, you can't make him miss out on Halloween. And he was tiny. Mm-hmm. He, was, he wasn't even two years old yet. And so I said, you know what? If you build it, they will come. Yeah, All right. Exactly. <laughs> right? So what I did is I had seen 
uh, several years before someone who had put tombstones in their yard, and it attracted a lot of kids. So I went out and I got these big uh, styrofoam boards and just cut them out into, uh, you know, little, put circles on the top to where it, the shape of a tombstone, and I made one with a cross, mm-hmm. and, and I, I wrote funny epitaphs that I had seen at Disney World. And um, that was it. And, boy, the kids mm-hmm. loved them. And I, we got mm-hmm. a lot of trick-or-treaters that year. So in the next year, I said, you know, I'm going to make three more and grow the, the, the cemetery. And this time <laughs> I'm going to put, like, maybe props in front of it. Like, I'll put, like, a heart and I put, like, a, a mask in front of it. And I'm just going to make it spookier, you know. So then my my family started getting involved and we would dress up and go into the into our yard and pose as if we were monsters so we wouldn't mm-hmm. move so we 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 wanted the people to wonder if we were real or not and when they had let down their guard we would scare them <laughs> <laughs> you know they'd say like oh i don't think she's real no i don't think she's real no, uh-huh. like a boop, you know and then they'd freak and it became really exciting you know, we felt like we were empowered now. You know, we can really scare people. So it mm-hmm. became an obsession. Every year I did three more tombstones, more props, and my son grew up with Halloween being a production. It was a theatrical production. So mm-hmm. it, I kept adding more and more, and then my husband um, would have skits in in our, in our um, garage, like one year was a mad scientist and we put strobe lights and body parts and another year it was a cave and with a two-way mirror inside and people would go in and get scared with the mask on the other side. We we started really getting into this production every year of of calling in these kids and Mm -hmm. they would bust them to our house. So when we wow. moved to well, yeah, when we moved to a bigger house, the reason at the house was because it had a great yard for a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> and the realtor said, "Please don't tell that to the owners of the house because they're very religious and they would freak out." Oh my know. gosh! So I started creating uh, this really big production. Um, we had a wraparound porch and a really huge yard, and what I would do is I would close off the porch. One side had curtains that were black, and the other side had curtains that were white, and we would do like a a mad scientist type of thing in in one part of of, of the porch, and people would walk through the porch and go through different scenes. Uh, We'd had strobe lights. We had really scary music, and... At that time, we were hosting exchange students, and so the mm-hmm. exchange students would participate as actors. And since we there were other exchange students in the district, we would invite them to be the actors also. So they they were learning about Halloween, and were participating as actors. And we mm-hmm. would get hundreds and hundreds of kids coming through our house every Halloween. We had That's crazy. Things. We had oh machines. We had re- we had real coffins. We had mannequins. We had it was. Uh, I had a, a marionette ghost that is called a flying crank ghost, and we would put a black light on her, and it was just so amazing. <laughs> That's what Halloween was like every year. And and my husband's job was to put our sound system up in our second story. We would put uh, these huge, huge speakers coming out of our windows in the second story, and we would run a soundtrack of thunder. And we would start it at <laughs> 3 o'clock. At, we would start it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We would start the thunder soundtrack so that when the kids got off the bus, they would hear it. And, oh, my gosh. Uh, we would, they, you, you could hear it like four blocks away. That was how loud it was because he had a great sound system. 
And then at 6 o'clock is when the official opening would start and then the, the scary music would come on with the screams and chains. and um, It was just a production. And then at 10 o'clock, Al- we took everything down. <laughs> Al- Alba, how many years did you do this? And And then tell us a little bit about why you stopped doing it. Well, the reason I, I started, I guess in what year that what 1992 is when I started. My son was little, mm-hmm. and I stopped in in 2005. And the reason wow. I did this Hall the reason I did this Halloween was because it was such a great exercise in manifesting. That was mm-hmm. what I loved most about it. I would sit in front of my yard in the dark looking at my house like maybe in September and I would envision everything that would be put, every single prop, exactly where it would be. Mm -hmm. And I learned that not only did I manifest exactly what I wanted, but it was even better. So it became... Mm -hmm. It became like an addiction, you know, as to how I could do it even better and better and better. But what happened was that after a while, um, it became an obligation. People wanted more and more. And um, after a while, you know, I was just tired of it. It was too many years of it, and nobody helped me. It was really tiring. Uh, I did right. it all by myself, right? I did it all by myself until the last day when my family would come in, but it was a lot of work. Um, I had, like, mm-hmm. an entire storage unit just of props and taking the coffins back and forth to storage. It, it was just a big ordeal. Mm-hmm. And the the reason I stopped was that one year I overheard a little boy say, this isn't scary, she had the same stuff last year. <laughs> right? Right. And I I realized he was right. I was no longer doing it for me. I was doing it for them. And mm-hmm. I had gotten lazy. And I didn't want to do it anymore. But my son had told me, oh, come on, Mom, you know, this exchange student hasn't seen Halloween. Let's, mm-hmm. let's do this again. And I did it for them. I didn't do it for me. So it became an obligation. And when I heard that little boy say that, I said, oh, my God, you can never do anything, you know, if, if your heart isn't into it. People know. Right. Mm-hmm. People know. You can't, you can't, um, I forgot what, I had I had said a quote, and, and I think you remember the quote that I had said. Um, I had posted it, um, that you can't hide from, you know, from yourself. Um, when you know you're doing a job that's not good enough, you know it and other people know it. You can't hide it. And that's mm-hmm. when I stopped. That's when I stopped. Mm-hmm. And um, the last year that I did this, the Halloween, we actually had 3,000 trick-or-treaters come by our house. Wow. Yeah. 3,000. That's a lot of trick-or-treaters, and that's a lot of candy. That's a lot of candy, and I know it was 3,000 because <laughs> that's how many pieces of candy I bought, and we I would fill up an entire Rubbermaid bin with it, and I would give one piece of candy to each trick-or-treater. And at the end of the night, I would had to turn them away because there was no more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it mm-hmm. was, you know, it was big. It was a big mm-hmm. production. So I, I got burned out, basically. Yeah. You, and and how about let's share with the listeners a little bit of the conversation that we had um, when we were talking about uh, Robert Monroe's concept of louche and your, um, uh, your production. Yes. Yeah. That is really important to understand. Uh, I didn't know what was happening at the time. Um, when I was doing the Halloween, I would get such a high from it. When I would hear the people scream, um, 
I would I would actually get high as if I was on drugs. It was it was so exciting for me. The screaming mm-hmm. and the atmosphere was so charged. There was such a charge in the atmosphere and I could feel totally I felt totally different when when we were doing this. The the whole yard felt different. Um and there was a charge in it and and it, 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 whenever you would hear someone scream, I would just get so excited. It was amazing because, <laughs> you know, it, first of all, we're doing a theatrical mm-hmm. production, so you figure when, if you sure. can scream out of someone, it's like getting an applause. You know, you, you actually did your job. But then years later, I found out about this bouge. And um, I, I think you could describe it better, what it is. Yeah, so for those of <laughs> Our listeners who don't know about Robert Monroe or about Louche, um, he was the first person, I, th- I believe he coined the term He in his books. He wrote back, I believe in the 70s, Journeys Out of the Body and Beyond the Body mm-hmm. and I think Far Journeys. So this was a man, Robert Monroe, he has an institute now called the Monroe Institute, but he was kind of like the expert on out-of-body experiences, and he did all kinds of explorations in all manner of reality, um, dimensions, etc. And in one particular uh, experience that he had, he was high above the planet, and he somehow was able to... Um, notice or watch things like wars or conflicts, etc. And he saw what some of these big, giant, you know, fear-creating, mongering, um, you know, fear-based things that humans would get involved in, how, how it would create this certain energy that would be released into the atmosphere. So he started paying mm-hmm. attention to this. It was as if he was watching energy. And he would watch this energy go out and he then realized that there were beings out there who were consuming it. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely um, eating it, living on it. And that term now is being used by any number of people who are, um, you know, looking into how reality is created um, and how, you know, the controllers or the Illuminati or et cetera, et cetera, um, how, you know, how that is the thing that they're actually trying to create when they try to mm-hmm. uh, bring those kinds of things, bring those kinds of things into our life. Yeah, I I would associate it if you could do a visual is like the in Harry Potter the Dementors that uh, feed off of people's fears. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Y- there's actual you're actually feeding these energies mm-hmm. with 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 the fear and uh once i discovered that i realized that i was i was a co-conspirator yeah you know, I, I was i was doing i was actually feeding them uh right. on halloween i was feeding right. all of these these dark beings that um consumed it and so mm-hmm. obviously now i i have a totally different idea of halloween I don't want to participate mm-hmm. in causing any fear, but mm-hmm. uh, it was a learning experience because I can tell you, you know, firsthand how it felt um, to conspire to do this. And you know, Alba, I, though yeah. the 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 thing that the the theatrical part of it is still amazing, and and mm-hmm. after we had the conversation, I started thinking about like you know the the grand. Um, Mexican and and, uh, South American traditions of the Day of the Dead and some of those things, those are a little different. You know, I think think you can can celebrate the thinning of the veils. You can celebrate um, the turning of the cycles and et cetera, et cetera, in in a different way. But when you, you know, if you worry too much or you create too much energy around, you know, a dummy with an axe coming out of their head, that's something (laughs) different, right? It's just different. It you know, when I was when I was doing this, um, I didn't think of it as anything except theater because I have never been one to watch scary movies. 
um, in in our family, we didn't watch scary movies. Uh, we didn't. Right. My ch- my son didn't grow up with any scary movies, no horror movies. We I have never seen a hollow you know one of those Halloween Freddy Krueger movies. I have no idea about any of that. So mm-hmm. people would come to to these productions and they would hear music like soundtrack from from the movies and they would they would get scared just hearing the soundtrack. And to mm-hmm. me it was funny because I could not associate anything of what they were feeling with my production because mm-hmm. I didn't have any association to it. So uh, being that I was doing it just out of theater, um, you know, it was mostly a cemetery. I didn't like to get into the gory stuff. I didn't get into the gory stuff until like the last couple of years. Um, but I, I actually bought somebody else's Halloween haunted house props. <laughs> I, I bought all of his mm-hmm. props. <laughs> and mm, so he wow. had a lot of body parts. So I said, well, you know, since he has them, I might as well use them. But my entire time that I had been doing this, it had only been focused on the cemetery. Um, and, you know, I didn't think sca- cemeteries were scary, <laughs> but other people did. So that was what the Halloween thing was all about. To me, it was a production. That's how my son looked at it. It was a theater production that Mommy did every year, and it was fun for us, you know. And it was, it was I a think safe I'm, place for kids to go to. I'm with you. I, I've always liked cemeteries. I know people, you know, think about them as being scary or whatever. I always think of them as, you know, stories. There are so many stories in every – right. I, yeah. I would I would look at headstones and I would think about the stories. Well, and speaking of stories, you've got a great session story that in part <laughs> contains um, some information and uh, an experience about a real haunted house. Would you tell us about that session? Yeah. That QHHT yeah. session. That was a QHHT session. Um, a woman came to me um, not too long ago telling me that she was concerned because she thought her house was haunted. And I had never had that request in a QHHT session before. I said, well, but, you know, let's let's find out. Mm-hmm. So when we get to the part of the higher self, I asked, you know, is her house haunted? And they said, yeah, it is. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, I asked to speak with the spirit of the house because that's what I do. You know, I don't just limit it to the higher self. I talk to whoever happens to be there and um this was a man who who used to own the house and he had died and i asked him what he was doing there he says well it's it's my house (laughs) and i said well yeah but you're not there anymore and you know the the lady of the house would like you to leave and they said well no it's my house you know i'm not leaving so i asked him how it was you know that he had died and he said well he had a heart attack and I found out that this, I actually did like kind of like a little regression on him, on his spirit, and found out that he had had an accident in the bathroom, which kept him uh, in a wheelchair. And one of the things that my client had told me is that she had heard a metallic noise coming from her daughter's room one day, which scared her. And when he told me that he was in a metal, that he was in a wheelchair. That's when I put two and two together. It's like, oh, so you're the one in the wheelchair. He goes, yes. I said, well, why is it that you don't scare the daughter if you're living in her room? And he says, well, I like her. (laughs) I like the daughter. (laughs) I said, but you don't like the lady of the house? He goes, no, because she wants me out of there. Uh So what I had to do is is a, a forgiveness exercise on him, which is, um, we I do role playing, not role playing, but I I talk to him and to the client, and we come to an agreement that this man wants to now evolve. Um, I, I talk him into uh, going to the light uh, because that's where his family is, that's where he's going to evolve, and um, I, I ask him if he would like her to forgive him for causing her all that that. Uh, you know, anguish and being scared. And then I asked her, you know, if she would forgive him for that. And 
and once we we come to an agreement that they've both forgiven each other, you know, for what they've caused, then I ask my angels to to escort him into the light. And so we we got so, rid of the so the haunted house. Albert, for for those people who may not be really familiar about the mechanics of a session, mm-hmm. so are you actually talking through your client to this yes. this spirit that is mm-hmm. um, haunting the house? Yeah, yeah. Just like we talk to the higher self, the same as mm-hmm. when we ask for the higher self to come through, and the higher self will come through. Um, I ask for whoever it is that is there to come through because it's it's it's, it's like a phone call away, okay? You, you just <laughs> you just call that person and, and you ask them for permission to talk to them, mm-hmm. and the person will come through and uh, you know you tell them that you know I'm you ask them their name and and you know you ask them any information that you want and they'll give it to you. So, so did that, that was a real haunted, haunted house. house problem. Did that solve her problem? You know, I haven't heard from her yet, but I would say it has. <laughs> and and that session was really interesting in a couple other ways as well, wasn't it? I mean, it was a it was a great session. Yeah, they they all <laughs> they all get exciting. Um, I guess the the other thing that she had. Um, this is the pirate, right? Is this the one we're talking about? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing that she had is, um, <clears throat> see, in my sessions, for some reason, the higher self, uh, the, as Dolores calls it, the subconscious, gives me little clues that it would like for me to dig even deeper. Um, we've come to an agreement like that. And um, the woman was experiencing some pain uh, some sensation, and so I asked what it was, and it and it happened to be another soul that was um, occupying space. It was renting space uh, in her body. So I asked to speak with this this other this other soul, and it's it was a man, and. Um, I said I asked him, well, you know, how is it that you died? And he says, uh, I was drowned. I said, okay. Well, let me take you back. And I did a little past life regression on on the soul. Let me take you back and and tell me uh, what you did before you died. And he was a a captain of a ship. And um, all of a sudden, uh, oh, and he was c- carrying gold in the ship. So that 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 put up a red flag to me. It's like, you know, how many people carry gold in their ships? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I took him to the last, the last moment of his death and, uh, they were shooting at him and they, they, these were the angry people that he stole the gold from. <laughs> I see. He was a pirate <laughs> and he, he had drowned in the water with his ship. So, um, that was when I, I asked um, the soul again if, um, you know, what it was doing there, if it would like to evolve into the light because it had, you know, it had not evolved. And, um, again, I called my angels to, to accompany him after after asking for forgiveness of, of causing harm to this woman. So, yeah, we find really interesting things going on. <laughs> Well, you know what's so fascinating? I, I don't know if, if our listeners are aware of um, exactly um, how interesting this is that Alba is talking about. So so in a QHHT session, the client lays down, they, they become very relaxed, and, and they go into an altered state, a hypnotic state, and they have experiences. Well, what Alba's just finished telling us is within this state, she was able then to talk to two other entities or spirits and then also with them take them to their past to find mm-hmm. out what was going on with them why so this right. is like it this is like a past life regression within a past life regression actually mm-hmm. two past life regressions within a past life regression and it's it's quite astonishing and I'm not so sure that I have ever even heard of Dolores Cannon herself attempting or finding herself 
doing something like this, and it's quite astonishing and very amazing. Yeah, I had one recently which was very interesting. It was a it was a woman who whose past life was a prince. She was a prince, and the prince was not very happy. Um, he found we found himself we found him eating in a very ornate room with the king and his sisters, princesses, and and the queen, and he was not happy. The next scene, we find him uh, in the countryside looking at the castle. The castle is burning, and he realizes, oh, my God, everybody died. I am now the king, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I move him forward, and now he is not a happy king because he didn't want to be a king. He was not king material and he ends up dying (laughs) he was reluctant king and he ends up dying um in the hands of the the soldiers because he was just very weak so i actually his own soldiers his own soldiers soldiers i remember reading killed him yeah they didn't like him (laughs) they didn't like him because he was a very very good king so I said, okay, let, let me find out what's going on here. Why why is this happening? So I took so I said, let me let me find out more about the king. So I called forward the king and asked to speak to the king. Which uh-huh. he came forth. And um I found out that the king uh had issues with the son. He didn't he really didn't like the the son at all that he preferred to have had another, uh, somebody else uh, control the kingdom. So I did a past life regression on him. (laughs) Another regression within a regression. (laughs) Right. So I did a past life regression on on the king. You're on a roll, Alba. Right. And the (laughs) the king, so so it ended up that the king had been married before, and he had had a daughter which he loved dearly, and he wanted the daughter to become queen, and the daughter refused. And he ended up marrying another woman who had this son and then other girls. And the, the son was the next in, in, in line to be the king, but he, he had been so devastated by the fact that his daughter didn't become queen that he could care less about his other family, about the rest of the family. So we got a lot of information from the king about why he treated the son the way he did. So, so yeah, you get really it gets really convoluted. How did that that story um, pertain to your client's life and their issues? Well, that, I don't even remember actually. It was it was. Uh, <laughs> It's hard enough just to remember about all the past lives. Um, it, it had to do something with it had something to do with um, her self esteem or mm-hmm. being, you know, wanting to take more control. She was not at she didn't have enough control. Um, oh, her, she didn't know, speak up. I remember that now. She didn't speak she up. She didn't speak That's up. Right. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. She didn't speak up. Yeah. So it had to do with the king you know, and how he treated the son, mm-hmm. and then it ended up being with her. So you're you're not just dealing with a past life regression of yourself. You're dealing with all the characters that are involved in your life and all mm-hmm. the other lives. And you know, Candace, that we're always we're living all these lives right now. Sure. So yeah, sure. that's why. So that's why it affects everybody. It affects everybody. Everybody's mm-hmm. part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, we're real, just doing time um, traveling. We're doing time. We're not doing past life regression. We're doing time traveling. I just love that. I really truly <laughs> love that. Hey, you know, one of the fun things that that you and I get to do as practitioners is when we get together, we get to have our our own session and um, without revealing to um, our <laughs> listeners what this session was about. Um, I, there's a uh, an audio clip that I'd kind of like to play for everyone. It's just one minute long, 
But there's – and who facilitated this session for you, Alba? This is, this is who, Jerry who, Johnson. Jerry Johnson mm-hmm. is uh, out of Asheville, North Carolina. He's a practitioner there, and he mm-hmm. facilitated this, my first session. This is your very first QHHT session? On um, myself. I had already been practicing for about six months. Right. And I had never had one on myself. Right. So this is the, the very first one that you had on yourself. And Jerry is such a great guy, but um, let me go over to the – the studio here and what I want to do now is just one minute clip that this is a one minute clip that Alba uh, sent to me where she is just um, discovering in in her own past life regression uh, who and what she is so so let's take a minute it's it's a one minute clip you ready Alba (laughs) okay here we go so this this is Alba's own past life regression uh, and and this is what about a year ago then, or a little more than a year ago? Yeah, year and a half. Year and a half okay, ago. so here's here's the here's the clip. <laughs> I mean, I'm really big. I'm huge. I'm really, 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 really big. <laughs> I mean, huge. Huge. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, I am humongous. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like a giant. I'm like huge. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, I'm huge. <laughs> do, you feel, do you feel male or female? I'm male. I'm male. I'm definitely male. I'm a big male bull. You know, big, big, big. I'm huge. <laughs> Alba, that just cracks me up. Are you there? I'm here. Hello? Oh, okay. I'm here. <laughs> I make sure I didn't lose you. That just I'm cracks here. me up. So 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 for those of you who think a past life regression is always really quiet and sedate <laughs> Al- <laughs> Alba will 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 let you know that uh, sometimes they can be kind of uh, boisterous and loud like that. And you just thought it was absolutely hysterical that you were really, really big. And what were you? What kind of life were you experiencing? I was a Sasquatch. (laughs) (laughs) And I didn't even – I I thought they were a myth at that time. You know, I didn't know anything about the Sasquatch people. And first – and I was thinking, why would I be seeing something that is a mythical creature? You know, because I didn't know anything about Sasquatch. And then all of a sudden see myself as one. And it really changed my life. That 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 session made me go down another path, you know, to discover more and more about the Sasquatch. But it was a crazy session. And and you just and you really felt being in the I mean it, you could you can tell by your your reaction, your genuine reaction, it's as if you just plucked yourself, you know, and, and put put you right into this other body where you're looking at these big hairy feet and this great yep. great big body and it's just so much different than your normal, you know, body that you're that you're used to and so that's what um that's what caused the reaction here. And this reaction, it's really interesting because you get a lot of different reactions from people when you practice this method. And sometimes people are in awe. You know, they're in complete awe. And other times people are, um, you know, sometimes they're a little trepidatious or other times they feel really, really strong and or they feel very, very free or whatever it is. And for you, you were just great, big, and hairy, and you just <laughs> found it so funny. And well, um, I'm only five. Think, I'm only five too, you know. So I wasn't used to seeing things from that that height. Right, right. 
Oh, gosh, yeah. And so do you think about that a lot um, this session? I mean, are there times throughout the day? And why did your SC show you a life as a Sasquatch? Well, it took me a long time to deal with that session. I think a lot of a lot of clients have the same problem in that, you know, you see something and you don't really want to deal with it. it it's, it's too shocking. Um, it took me about six months to actually deal with it because I was, I didn't understand why, why I was shown that life. It bothered me and, and I was embarrassed of it because I said, you know, Sasquatch, come on, you know, out of anything else, <laughs> why a Sasquatch? You know, come on. Started doing the video because that's, that's one, that was my first YouTube video that I put up on my channel because I wanted people to know that, you know, I had one too. And mine was crazy. Um, as I started watching the video over and over again, or sorry, or listened to the uh, session over and over again, it started to make sense to me. There was a lot hidden in there that pertained to me. It was personal to me. Um, and it had to do a lot with the way I am, the way I think. And once I started researching the Sasquatch people, it made total sense to me as to what they were trying to tell me. So not only was it a message about myself, but it was also a message about the Sasquatch people that, you know, I was connected to them. And I don't see it as a past life. I see it as a parallel life. This is a parallel ah. life that I was having. Okay. This is a Sasquatch that, that is out there right now you know, or has been out there. I don't see it as, as something in a in the past. I saw it as modern day right right now. Things that are happening mm-hmm. right now. Uh, all the people mm-hmm. all the people were dressed modern. We were we're dealing with a modern time Sasquatch, not in the past. So I see. Uh once yeah, so once I started uh, researching it, I said, Oh, you know, there's there's a lot for me to do and the Sasquatch are a connection to me. You know, these mm-hmm. you know, I do have a connection with the Sasquatch people and and they they are they are probably my guides also, you know, because that's what mm-hmm. they do. You know, they're here they're here to help the earth and they, they are very wise and they're very gentle and um you know, beautiful things about the Sasquatch. So I could see that I I had a, I had to go down this path with the Sasquatch people. So yeah, mm-hmm. you learn a lot about yourself, <laughs> don't you? Um, yeah, I remember <laughs> a session a session that um, a fellow practitioner gave me as well, and I I got to meet an aspect of myself, and that uh. aspect of myself was huge, and that aspect then spoke through me and it was really interesting because there's a there's a part I, I probably could find this tape and play it at some point too there's a part in, of this session where I am speaking as my aspect talking about me and I'm saying something completely different I'm actually saying huh. about me and my body saying oh my god I knew she was there but she's she's so little she's she's <laughs> just so little wow <laughs> So the That's amazing, opposite, isn't it? it? It was crazy, yeah, because it, um, this aspect and I communicate kind of like on a gut level and an intuitive mm-hmm. level a little bit, nothing nothing very precise, more, more big picture kind of things. And, and this guy is a great big kind of uh, warrior dude, you know, very... Um, mm. Very, very proud of his strength and burly, um, um, you know, heft and all of that. And and he had felt connected with me here and was, we we were, um, and, and comparing notes about different things, about personalities and people and or beings and, and relationships, et cetera, you know, how to deal with people, et cetera. And um, it was just interesting that he he had a respect for me and I for him, but the part that surprised him was just, well, but she's so little. <laughs> That's amazing, huh? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, really amazing. These sessions are so amazing. Everyone's so every one of them is so different. Yeah, they're really, really different. I, I'm looking here at a couple of my notes about some of your other sessions, and and there's there's one that I I wish you would tell uh, our listeners about the one um, where you were talking with the cells, uh, the oh. cells, uh, the the person mm-hmm. who has the cornea transplant, and you know, yeah, Alba, not to not to not to uh, bring anyone down here because as I recall this memory, it, it, it's not going to be sad. It's going to be kind of a joyous one. But my brother died in a motor, motorcycle accident and mm. um, he donated his eyes. Wow. So, wow. so he, he did exactly this. He, he sent his eyes on, but I, yeah. I think the uh, outcome may have been a little different because I, mm-hmm. I've been able to, have some after death communication with my brother and and all of that is fine and 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 well but but your client had a different story would you tell our listeners about this story this session yeah the the client came in saying that he um he had had a cornea transplant and it had, it had gone well but it, he was still seeing a little fuzzy so he wanted some healing <clears throat> so when it came to the part where i asked the the higher self to to see what he could you know what can be done he said uh, no we can't heal it because there's a lot of anger there okay uh and i said in the in the cells and he goes yeah so i said well let me talk to the cells <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. because you can talk to a- everything has consciousness you can talk to anything it's, everything has consciousness it's just a telephone if if you it's if just you a leave, telephone something call else away. Would... <laughs> That's why I'm in telecommunication. That's right. <laughs> Love it. So I said, let me talk to the cells. So I, I asked the cells what was going on, what's the problem here. And it said, well, um, the, the the making it short, the recipient was very angry, and they can't heal because there was a lot of anger involved in 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 this person. So I said, okay, all right. Let me put you on the side. Let me talk to the the, the spirit of the of the donor. Okay, so he came through. I asked him his name. I asked him for his age, and I asked him how was it that he died. And he was a twenty year old man who had died in a motorcycle accident, and he was very angry when he died because, well, his life was cut short at such a young age, and another uh, motorcycle um, rider had done something and his wheel had malfunctioned and uh, it it killed him. Uh, Mm -hmm. So he was angry at this other guy for killing him, for for causing his death. So, again, he he, he couldn't evolve without forgiving this this man for killing him. So I told him, listen, you know, you did a beautiful thing donating your eyes. Uh, I know that that's what you wanted to do, but unfortunately, it's not. It's you've given him a gift that's not going to work. It's the cells cannot um, do anything unless you let go of this anger and you forgive this person that that killed you. And it took a little, um, you know, talking back and forth until finally he he realized that. You know, he had to do it in order to help this other this man who who was the recipient. And again, we went through the forgiveness exercise. I asked my angels to escort him to the light, and um, you know, we we got back to the cells, and the cells said that now that that anger had been released, that they could now um, heal. So that was a really beautiful session. In that, um, you know, it did help this this man so and he has gotten back to me and he says that um you know he has his eyes eyesight is is improving and it's it's working so i'm very very that's amazing yeah that's amazing have you you had in go ahead no what what i was thinking about what really was the whole thing about that session that really had me thinking is you know we do so many transplants um you know, in in hospitals, and so many people donate, you know, their body and their organs and tissues, and there's no 
um, blessing, no Mm -hmm. ritual, when you put this in somebody's body. And, you know, it's something that you really should think about, you know, when to, to bless to bless them to if if somebody has received a gift from someone to to acknowledge it and and thank that person for that gift mhm mm-hmm. you know it's not quite the same thing but anything and everything that we put into our bodies has a story and has an energy so mm-hmm. for example you know if you if you are still a person who um, still eats animal protein, for example, if you eat animal protein that's come from, you know, a factory farm, let's say chicken, that's lived in a tiny, tiny cage who had its beak cut off and has never seen sunlight in its life, you know, if you if you ingest the meat from that creature, you ingest that creature's story and you mm-hmm. adapt and take in that energy and and that's why we pray over our food that's that's where grace and blessing you know came from mm-hmm. so it's, yep. but when you when you do a transplant like that it's it's even bigger because you you put that body that living story into your tissue so right, um, right. have you have you done any other sessions with people who've had transplants no i haven't i mean i've had you know surrogate sessions where you've had you know other people that we're dealing with but um uh, not not with transplants i've talked to mm-hmm. cells before i mean cells mm-hmm. are kind of fun to talk to uh, <laughs> i talked <laughs> well everything you could talk to anything every because everything yes, has you consequences can. you could actually zero in and say you know i want to talk i had a woman who said you know she was overweight and she wanted to lose weight and so i asked to speak with a fat, fat cell <laughs> Oh my god. And and you can't ever tell a cell to to that you want to get rid of it because it's like telling that you're going to kill it. Right. Um you know, you, you can never tell any part of your body to go away. It's 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 not it's not right. It's 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 not logical. Mm-hmm. You know, they have they all mm-hmm. have a, a a you know, a piece of the puzzle. So you have mm-hmm. to you kind of have to negotiate with this fat cell and and explain, you know, maybe maybe you would like to, you know, visit someone who's starving, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and and do 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 something for them, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, you could talk to any part of your body. Of course, and I think you know you you make a great point there about about the cells. I, I think a lot about how we as a society talk about how we need to fight diseases or fight things Mm -hmm. like cancer, you know, the battle with cancer. Well, cancer doesn't need to be fought. Cancer needs to be understood. It's just another story. It's another story that's in somebody's thought. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, All, all cells want to be loved. You know, that's why the way you talk to your body is really important. And, you know, we do that with a, a, a meditation that, that Dolores taught us, is that, you know, you love your body. The way you talk to it is very important. And every cell is alive. And we are the gods and goddesses of our bodies. And the way we talk to our body is the way they react. So you talk bad about your body, it's it's going to feel depressed and, and and sad because you are its god and goddess. And so when you take good care of it, you, you give it good food and you talk to it and tell it what you want, they'll be happy to take care of it because, you know, that's what they're there for. They live for you. It's kind of cool talking to the cells. It's, it's cool talking to all kinds of things. I mean, you can be a molecule. You can have, um, you know, life as – I remember one of the strangest ones that I ever had was we discovered – that this woman was a piece of gravity on the moon. <laughs> oh my gosh. A piece. I mean not you know, like not all of gravity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> piece of yeah. It. I mean it's a very strange thing. I mean her experience how how odd is that that she transported her consciousness to the moon, a tiny little mm-hmm. patch, 
you know, a, a few square inches on the surface of the moon yeah. that was the that was gravity there, the energy of gravity mm-hmm. of a few square inches on the moon. Now, who would have ever thought that your consciousness could describe that and that we could have a discussion about what that was, what it was like, yeah. and why she was experiencing that? I mean, how crazy is that? That's <laughs> I'm yeah, off the uh, that reminded me of a, a really strange session that I had that was very similar to that, that this uh, man had a, a, a session where he was some sort of vapor. It was vapor. It was it was like oxygen or something. He was he was not a, he was he was he didn't have a body and he was actually living on a some sort of like a asteroid or or some sort of a a body of 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 rock floating through space that hmm. actually had some sort of a humanoid powering it and the whole place was very futuristic looking it had a lot of pipes and and very strange stuff and it ended up you know being like a future life in the future so he was also just consciousness on there. So, Alva, you said that this whole asteroid was being propelled by a human? Is that what you said? Humanoid, yeah, like a humanoid. Uh, interesting. Yeah, it was very strange. He, he he described all these tubes that mm-hmm. that it and the engine how it, it it propelled itself. It was a different type of engine that we know. But yeah, it was a humanoid that was actually driving this thing. Very strange. Driving an like driving an asteroid. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Very very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it may not have been asteroid. It was, a, it was a rock. It was a rock formation that that floated through space. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You get a lot of strange things that that you hear about. Well, I'm looking at my notes. You've you've done some really great surrogate sessions too. Would you um, tell our listeners a little bit about what a QHHT surrogate session even is, and then maybe tell us about a couple of interesting ones that you've had. Mm-hmm. Well, my first one was really interesting. It was a woman who had schizophrenia, and we cannot do sessions with people with schizophrenia, so. Someone had called me and said, listen, you know, there's this young woman who I know there's something else going on with this woman. Can you do a session on her? I said, no, absolutely not, but I can do a session on somebody else and have them connect with the higher self. So um, we had a session with him, with his past life and everything, and then later we connected with his higher self, and then I asked for permission to speak with her higher self. And what it ended up being was that this woman, this young woman, had been um, raped when she was a little girl, like four years Mm -hmm. old, okay? And they described what the person looked like, everything. Uh, The higher self told me exactly what had happened. And when she had been raped, it allowed another soul her body. Um, and when that other soul entered her body, it was the soul of a, of like a, of an Arabic rich woman who had lived many, huh. many years ago. Okay, many, I mean, centuries ago. And this Arabic woman, at when she was alive, um, had like dancing girls you know, who who were in the palace. And mm-hmm. she favored one dancing girl who happened to be this schizophrenic woman. So she never wanted to not have a body. So when she, uh, when this little girl was raped, it gave her the opportunity to take over and inhabit her body. As a, She was a disembodied soul. And so this little girl grew up talking like she was a rich woman, ordering people around, (laughs) talking another, talking in tongues, talking in a different language that no one understood. And that's when, you know, we found out that it was was this 
the soul of this woman who they had known each other before. So in that session, the the higher self actually talked, uh, gave three messages. It gave a message first to the um, the girls, the schizophrenic girl's mother, on how she should treat her daughter. It gave a message to the daughter, and it gave a message to the soul of the rich woman. And it told hmm. the rich woman to leave. Hmm. And that it was time for her to go. And it was it was a jaw dropper. It was it was wild. So, so that was this? my first target session. It was your very first one. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing to me. That that did this you, is why did, this girl was talking in tongues. <laughs> Did you ask or um, come to discuss with the higher self how another soul comes in anyway? There are those who would say that that can only happen with, you know, permission, that on some level the higher self gave permission for that. Did did you discuss that at all, or what are your thoughts on I was, that? I was... I was kind of in shock because it was my first one, and I I I, right. I really um, had no idea what this was all. I didn't expect that. I, I just right. didn't expect it. So I I now I would get into that conversation, but uh, at the I think that it was giving me clues by uh, telling me how she got there because when you mm-hmm. um, go through some sort of trauma like that, uh, it lowers your vibration. Mm-hmm. And um, once you lower your vibration, you're you're a match to to other other uh, lower vibrational forms, you know. And I think it was giving me clues that that's what it was. That you know, that's when this little girl, you know, kind of gave up and allowed this to happen. You know, allowed somebody mm-hmm. else who was stronger. You know, when you when you think about it, you know this rich woman was a very strong, strong person. So if the little girl was feeling disempowered, you know, who else would help her? You know, she was, Mm -hmm. she was someone who uh, maybe the little girl uh, recognized it, you know, recognized the soul from another life and allowed her to take over. You know, it was her boss before. So was there improvement then in this woman's life, the schizophrenic yeah. woman's life? Yeah, that you the, the, that the, man, the man did call me later and said that there had been great improvement. I haven't, I don't keep track after that, you know. Sure. Uh, I don't call them unless they call me. Sure. Uh, sure. Most people don't don't like to be pestered after a session, but um, <laughs> <laughs> unless they, they want to tell you, but. Yeah, that was sure. that was my very first uh, surrogate, and it was the first one that I had seen another soul. Uh, and so, I guess my higher self was kind of introducing me to um, something that I would be getting more involved with, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, later. Mm-hmm. But that was good. Another surrogate session that I had was with Sparky the dog. Um, uh, let's hear about Sparky. <laughs> well. Um, this is a, a session that I actually have on YouTube. Uh, it's towards the mm-hmm. end. It's called the Universal Message, and this was a, an amazing QHHT session. And before we started, we had been discussing my dog because my dog is is very old. And uh, she said, "Oh yeah, I have a dog too." And I said, "You know, um, you know, you can talk to your dog. You know, you can we could do a surrogate session on your dog." And she said, "Yeah, really?" And I said, "Yeah." So towards the end. Um, I asked to speak to Sparky. And uh, if you see the YouTube video, you could see that she totally changes. I felt as if, I felt as if she was wagging her tail (laughs) when I was talking to her. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, I, I just was interviewing Sparky and Sparky, you know, told me that uh, he was very happy that they had rescued him because, you know, he didn't want to, uh, I guess he didn't want to die at such a young age. You know, he was at the shelter. 
And uh, I asked him what he liked, and he, he liked biscuits. And it was just really fun to, to speak with, with a dog. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the client was really happy, too, because she actually felt the, you know, what Sparky felt like to to speak, you know, as Sparky. Mm-hmm. And, you and know, there was and some that, sort of message. Um, it was just a, a nice message that you know it was it it was very very um, happy that they had uh, rescued him. The dog was very grateful for the love. It loved to be hugged, and it, it was just a, a very you know thank you. It was the dog wanted to just say thank you for for you know being my family. So it was very Aww. nice. That was really nice. And uh, another surrogate session that I had, which I didn't even expect it to be a surrogate session, was uh, another one that I have on YouTube that was my cousin wanted to find out more for our family tree. And she wanted to get some information about our our ancestors. And the, mm-hmm. an- the, the higher self said, well, go to the pier. You know, and I figured it was talking about maybe some sort of a registry that that was there, <laughs> uh-huh. right? I mean, the higher self says, go to the pier. And I went, oh, you know, okay. And then all of a sudden, my cousin is living the life of my grandmother. She actually did a surrogate for my grandmother. So talk about convoluted. She huh. found herself on the ship going from Spain to Cuba, Um, I had the higher self look for her, and they found her on the ship, very nauseated, making the long trip across. And then my cousin went through the excitement of meeting her, her husband in Cuba and, you know, how she felt being in love and and how she felt in a new country and then um, her husband dying. And then... After she and then her her death scene, and then after she passed, what she was seeing and experiencing after she passed. So that was convoluted too, and that was a that was kind of like a impromptu surrogate session. That's really interesting, and <laughs> and yeah. so I, it makes me ask or wonder so many questions. Like, you know, were you close with your grandmother? Did you know about her? Did your did your cousin, did you all, I mean, did, was there some mystery that was solved or what? We, we um, my, my grandmother died when I was six and my cousin was two when she died. So she really uh-huh. didn't know my grandmother. Um, you know, she knew her up until she was two years old. So uh, she didn't really have too much um, interaction with my grandmother. And... Um, we we did, you know what I think that we got out of that session was just, um, just a visit from my grandmother. It, it was it was right. the, we didn't really learn anything new except um, you know her feelings. I, I learned where my mother got some of her um, fears from, which then she passed on to me. So when I heard my grandmother talking I went oh my god <laughs> that's that's where it came from <laughs> so <laughs> you know how kind of like the DNA kind of you know you learn things from mm-hmm. from your grandparents I was listening mm-hmm. to my grandmother and I was saying oh my god you know that's that's where I learned from this is where it came from and my my cousin of course is the opposite so she didn't really get any of that from from my grandmother but it was just a fun, it was just nice being able to visit with my grandmother you know, it was it was just I, I really bet. nice. And and how surprising for your cousin who was just two when when she died. So, Alba, did did you all do that um, in a, in English or in Spanish? <laughs> well, it was it was both. <laughs> it was both. <laughs> we we kind of flip flop every once in a while. Um, sometimes it would be in Spanish and sometimes it would be in English. In in the video, I actually put the subtitles. In whenever it was in Spanish, um, mm-hmm. you know I've had clients before that flip flop, and for me it's 
it's like breathing. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether what language they're talking in. I'll, I'll just jump in to whichever one they, they want to talk in. But with my cousin, mm-hmm. um, every time an ancestor would come through, um, it, they would start speaking in Spanish. Mm-hmm. And I've done the same thing. When I've had QHHT sessions and they've the practitioner has asked to speak with my my father, for example, has come through and he'll speak in Spanish. You know, he'll mm-hmm. he'll start talking in Spanish. But yeah, it was a really nice nice visit with her. We since we didn't spend any time with her growing up, it was it was just nice to have a nice visit and get to know her life a little bit more. So it was unusual. Yeah. So you do sessions in English and in Spanish, and yeah. do they differ at all, the, the two languages <laughs> or the two cultures? How how are they different? How are they the same if you're not mixing them up like you are with your kids? Well, the, the first session that I had in 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 Spanish was was my hardest one because the SC wouldn't come through, the, the subconscious wouldn't come through, and and I kept begging, please, you know, just throw me a bone here, just let me let me let me hear you in Spanish. And the SC, it sounds exactly the same to me. They have the same tonality, they have the same way of talking. It's amazing um, when you hear them that it's almost it's exactly the same. And you know what I'm talking about. They, they, mm-hmm. You just know. As a practitioner, you just know when it's the higher self. And in mm-hmm. Spanish, it's exactly the same. The only thing that it differs in my sessions is that the Hispanic community is more open to other realms. You know, they have uh-huh. they are, they grew up they grew up with more spirituality, more uh, things that are. Uh, no brainers for them, you know. They'll come to me and they'll say, um, you know, listen, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a real devout uh, follower of this ascended master, and um, this is who I want to talk to. And you, you know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, and mm-hmm. or, or you know, I, I, I know that um, I have to forgive for things that I did and and these people are just more in tune with their spirituality. Uh they grew mm-hmm. up with it. Um mm-hmm. There's a lot more religions that are based on on other things than than what we know um are just basic uh, you know religions. So, yeah, I have people mm-hmm. who are a lot more open to what's just happened to them. They expect mm-hmm. it. They almost expect mm-hmm. weird stuff to happen, <laughs> so they're very open. Right. <laughs> yeah, actually, Alba, we've got a, a lady in the chat room named Alicia who she wants to know why she has the feeling that she's meant to do magic for real. And I have a thought about that. What do you think of that question? Why does somebody? Why would somebody feel like they are meant to do magic for real? Does that bring up anything for you? We we always do magic. We're all doing magic. Mm-hmm. All of us. Mm-hmm. Um, we just don't know that that we can. Uh, we do magic every day, but we don't pay attention. Mm-hmm. I think so it, it depends on what magic she's talking about. But you know, we create right. our own reality. I think actually I have a thought about that and and my thought is this there's there's the idea of stage magicians you know and even as a child I didn't like them for some reason you know the the basic the guy with the the coins or the hat or mm-hmm. the rabbit or I I never liked them and I didn't know why because all of my friends were very excited when it would be a magic show. And there was something about it that just bothered me. And I I didn't know what that was until starting to do this work. And it occurred to me that the reason that I don't like stage magicians is because think about what it is that um, that a stage magician is doing with, with their audience. They are standing up on stage 
and the audience is sitting before him or her, and he is saying, okay, I'm going to be doing some things up here that that's pretend magic, and you're going to, to you know, pretend to believe it, <clears throat> but we all know there's no no such a thing as magic. And it took me a really long time to figure out the fact that I knew that magic was real, and it pissed mm-hmm. me off to watch a stage musician um, stand up there and and kind of commandeer everyone's attention and make it sound like magic wasn't real because I knew magic was really real. And and so to me, a stage magician just helps the farce of us being powerless and weak mm-hmm. and not able to tap into real magic, um, you know, perpetuates that idea. So so that's my take on magic. What do you think of that, Alicia? <laughs> <clears throat> well, Alba, we're coming down towards the end of um, our time together. Is there any more sessions you, you'd like to tell us about before we before we say good night for the evening? Boy, I think I've said so many already. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you tell us? Why don't you tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel and maybe how um, people can watch some of those sessions there and, and, and some of the other things that you offer, um, and we'll just, uh, you know, call it a night then. Yeah, um, the, the YouTube channel can just be reached by just typing in my name, Alba Weinman, that's the channel name. And on mm-hmm. there I have, um, I, have QH, I have QHHT sessions. I don't have the whole session. I, I don't like to put um, entire sessions because this, you know, people have private information that I don't like to mm-hmm. divulge. But you'll sure. have, you'll see partials. And I also have um other types of sessions which are not QHHT sessions. They're more hypnotherapy because I do have almost four hundred hours of hypnotherapy training. So I do other types of hypnotherapy also which is not QHHT and those I call the uh spiritual journey of forgiveness. And uh, I also show some of those. Those are for different cases where um you know, we do different things. But um I love the QHHD sessions. They're 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 amazing. And uh you know, for anybody who's thinking of getting one, um, you know, I know Candace that you agree with me. I would have people uh contact a practitioner near them and see who resonates best with them. Um you know, there is no competition in practitioners. Everybody um, is attracted to the practitioner that will be the best for them. And that's how I feel with, with my clients, that the ones who will come to me are the ones who are meant to come to me. And, um, you know, you can look at the YouTube channel and, and see kind of like what a session would be like, but not really. That's <laughs> They're all different. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Your session is not going to be like any session there, so uh, it just it just makes you see how people can go into trance and uh, see different things and uh, mm-hmm. how real it is for them. Mhm. Mhm. And do you still do your coaching work? I do very little of it. Uh, I still do some coaching. Uh, I do that over the phone during the week, but. Um, mhm. You know, I like to get in into people's souls. I I think that that's the most fun of it. Um, you know, I did coaching for many many years, and I I loved it, and that you know we got a lot of success out of it. But now, you know, why spend so much time on somebody when I can just get right to them and and get to the get to the issue right away. And again, you do sessions in English and and in Spanish. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, my my sessions are either English or Spanish. And in Miami, we have a lot of people who speak Spanish, and they're very open to it. And uh, I would say more of my clients are in, uh, are in Spanish now than they are in English. A word does get mm-hmm. get around. So, mm-hmm. so um, you know, I do either one and. Um, you know, I've been doing group regressions and um, 
it's it's just a nice thing to to do. I I really love doing this. I really love doing this work too, Alba. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to spend part of your Friday evening with us. What are you doing for Halloween tomorrow? <laughs> I'm having a session. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. Oh, I, I bet it'll I, I didn't be a good have one. one yeah, I I can't wait. I can't wait. I think it's going to be great. And um, you know, I I don't know the client yet, but I just have a feeling it's going to be a, a, a. I always say that with every client. I think it's going to be a really great session. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to it. So that's how my Halloween mm-hmm. will be. I will be doing what I do with the sessions. I'll be time traveling with them. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, um, again, thank you so much for joining me and the rest of our listeners tonight. And and would you come back again and talk to us when you have some more sessions under your belt? (laughs) Sure, sure. Thank you for inviting me. It's been so much fun. you're, You're very welcome. It's been a lot of fun. So I'd like to remind those of you, again, looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, that you can find them at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's DoloresCannonQHHT.com. And you can find out more about my own practice of QHHT at NewEarthJourney.com. I practice right smack dab in the middle of the country here in Kansas. And I'd like to ask you all to join us again next Friday. We'll we'll have another amazing show lined up for you. So good night, all, and happy Halloween. Good night, Alba. Happy Halloween. Good night. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Bye. And at that time, we were hosting exchange students. And so the mm-hmm. exchange students would participate as actors. And since we, there were other exchange students in the district, we would invite them to be the actors also. So they, they were learning about Halloween and were participating as actors. And we mm-hmm. would get hundreds and hundreds of kids coming through our house every Halloween. We had That's fog crazy. machines. We had oh fog gosh. machines. We had re- we had real coffins. We had mannequins. We had it was. Uh, I had a a marionette ghost that is called a flying crank ghost, and we would put a black light on her, and it was just so amazing. <laughs> That's what Halloween was like every year. And and my husband's job was to put our sound system up in our second story. We would put uh, these huge, huge speakers coming out of our windows in the second story, and we would run a soundtrack of thunder. And we would start it at <laughs> 3 o'clock. At, we would start it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We would start the thunder soundtrack so that when the kids got off the bus, they would hear it. And, oh, my gosh. Uh, we would, they, you, you could hear it like four blocks away. That was how loud it was because he had a great sound system. <laughs> and then at 6 o'clock is when the official opening would start and then the, the scary music would come on with the screams and chains. and um, It was just a production. And then at 10 o'clock, oh. we took everything down. Uh, Alba, how many years did you do this? And and then tell us a little bit about why you stopped doing it. Well, the reason I, I started, I guess in what year that was? 1992 is when I started. My son was little, mm-hmm. and I stopped in in 2005. And the reason wow. I did this Hall- the reason I did this Halloween was because. It was such a great exercise in manifesting. That was what I loved most about it. I would sit in front of my yard in the dark looking at my house like maybe in September. And I would envision everything that would be put, every single prop, exactly where it would be. Mm -hmm. And I learned that not only did I manifest exactly what I wanted, but it was even better. So it became, mm-hmm. 
it became like an addiction, you know, as to how I could do it even better and better and better. But what happened was that after a while, um, it became an obligation. People wanted more and more. And um, after a while, you know, I was just tired of it. It was too many years of it, and nobody helped me. It was really tiring. Uh, I did right. it all by myself, right? I did it all by myself until the last day when my family would come in, but it was a lot of work. Um, I had, like, mm-hmm. an entire storage unit just of props and taking the coffins back and forth to storage. It was just a big ordeal. Mm-hmm. And the the reason I stopped was that one year I overheard a little boy say, this isn't scary. She had the same stuff last year. <laughs> right? Right. And I I realized he was right. I was no longer doing it for me. I was doing it for them. Mm-hmm. And I had gotten lazy. And I didn't want to do it anymore. But my son had told me, oh, come on, Mom, you know, this exchange student hasn't seen Halloween, let's Mm -hmm. do this again. And I did it for them. I didn't do it for me. So it became an obligation. And when I heard that little boy say that, I said, oh, my God, you can never do anything, you know, if if your heart isn't into it. People know. Mm -hmm. People know. You can't, you can't, um, I forgot what, I had, I had said a quote, and, and I think you remember the quote that I had said, um, I had posted it, um, that you can't hide from, you know, from yourself. Um, When you know you're doing a job that's not good enough, you know it and other people know it. You can't hide it. And that's Mm -hmm. when I stopped. That's when I stopped. Mm -hmm. And um, the last year that I did the Halloween, we actually had 3,000 trick-or-treaters come by our house. Wow. Yeah. 3,000. That's a lot of trick-or-treaters, and that's a lot of candy. That's a lot of candy, and I know it was 3,000 because <laughs> that's how many pieces of candy I bought, and we I would fill up an entire Rubbermaid bin with it, and I would give one piece of candy to each trick-or-treater. And at the end of the night, I would had to turn them away because there was no more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So it mm-hmm. was, you know, it was big. It was a big mm-hmm. production. So I, I got burned out, basically. Yeah. You, and and how about let's share with the listeners a little bit of the conversation that we had um, when we were talking about uh, Robert Monroe's concept of louche and your, um, oh, your production. Yes. Yeah, that is really important to understand. Uh, I didn't know what was happening at the time. Um, When I was doing the Halloween, I would get such a high from it. When I would hear the people scream, um, I would I would actually get high as if I was on drugs. It was it was so exciting for me the screaming, Mm -hmm. and the atmosphere was so charged. There was such a charge in the atmosphere, and I could feel totally, I felt totally different when when we were doing this. The the whole yard felt different, um, and there was a charge in it. And and whenever you would hear someone scream, I would just get so excited. It was amazing because, (laughs) you know, it's, First of all, we're doing a theatrical mm-hmm. production, so you figure when, if you sure. can scream out of someone, it's like getting an applause. You know, you, you actually did your job. But then, years later, I found out about this bouge. And um, I, I think you could describe it better, what it is. Yeah, so for those of <laughs> our listeners who don't know about Robert Monroe or about Louche, um he was the first person, I, th- I believe he coined the term He in his books, he wrote back, I believe in the 70s, Journeys Out of the Body and Beyond the Body, mm-hmm. and I think Far Journeys. So this was a man, Robert Monroe, he has an institute now called the Monroe Institute, but he 
was kind of like the expert on out-of-body experiences, and he did all kinds of explorations in all manner of reality, um, dimensions, etc. And in one particular uh, experience that he had, he was high above the planet, and he... Blog Talk Radio. You're tuned in to N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in-depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in 3, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1. Greetings, and welcome to Quantum Healing with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Craw goldman This program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world, and its foundation is based upon the late, great Dolores Cannon's work. So thank you, Dolores, for continuing to be here with us. And also thanks to Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling at N5D.com for making this show possible. With humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that consciousness plays in shaping both our individual and our collective reality, we have plenty of subject material. I am a full-time practitioner of Dolores' hypnosis method and had the honor and privilege of working with and alongside of that great lady for several years. You can find out more about my practice at newearthjourney.com. And before we get started tonight, for those of you looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, you may find these wonderful people at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. And also, if you'd like to participate live on the show tonight, please call in. The U.S. number is 646-716-8890. That's 646-716-8890. And we'll try to answer as many calls as possible. So tonight is October 30th, 2015. And happy Halloween. I am so excited about tonight's show. I have a lovely woman and friend and fellow practitioner joining me today. Her name is Alba Weinman. Alba Weinman was born in Havana, Cuba. And she came to the United States shortly after Fidel Castro took control of the country in 1959. She grew up in Fort Lee, New Jersey, excuse me, viewing the New York City skyline from her bedroom window. And after finishing high school, she moved to Miami, Florida, where she lives now. She's worked in the telecommunications field for 35 years and is always finding creative ways to use information and technology to, prefer, to improve her life and business. And the most unconventional technology she uses now is automatic writing, which I need to talk to her about, <laughs> a practice in which her guides and spiritual teachers communicate with her via a pen and paper. To put these teachings to good use, she founded Hopes and Achievements, Inc., and has been doing life coaching. And although this was very satisfying, She longed to reach into clients' souls and help them from there. And that's where QHHT, Quantum Healing Hypnosis, Dolores Cannon's method, came in. And it was the next logical step for Alba. Whenever Alba does anything, she puts her heart and soul into it. And this was the case when she began to build a haunted cemetery in front of her house each year for Halloween. She used her imagination, creativity, technology, and the law of traction to create a bigger and better destination for neighborhood trick-or-treaters each year. And perhaps many of you are seeing some of those pictures scroll on the computer screen right now. Alba is fluent (coughs) in English and Spanish and practices QHHT in Miami, Florida. She has a YouTube channel under her name where you can view some of her hypnosis 
profession. And I want to extend a very warm welcome to my dear friend, Alba. Hi, Alba. Hi, Candace. <laughs> there you are. That was a I long am. intro. I know. I've got a little uh, tickle in my throat. There, It's raining here in Kansas, and I think it stirred up some mold. So pardon me for that. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. That's really wonderful. Well, let's start with how you found Dolores. How did you learn about Dolores? How did you discover her? How did you get into this work? Oh, it was a long journey, Candace. A really long journey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I think that maybe our generation isn't isn't as quick to 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 find out about this stuff, and uh, it took uh, many many years to get to where I am right now. Should I start with the beginning? Well, sure. That's where Dolores <laughs> says it's always the smart place to start. That's right. Well, it all started with my spirituality and, and finding out about it. And it, it came in a very unconventional way. Um, it all started with a makeup sponge, um, believe it or not. Um, I I was one day... Um, I was living with my mom at the time. I had just gotten divorced, and uh, I used to use this makeup sponge. And one day, the makeup sponge disappeared. And it was, you know, okay. It, you know, things happen. They fall. and But days later, the makeup sponge ends up um, right at the end, edge of my bed. And I had made that bed, like, every day. And all of a sudden, this makeup sponge is there. And I said, this is really weird. It's almost like somebody's trying to get my attention. And that's where the spirituality started. This is back in 1988. And uh, I knew that somebody had placed that makeup sponge there, but I couldn't figure out how it happened. So I got interested in spirituality, and I discovered Shirley McLean. And uh, at that time, she had written a book called Out on a Limb, which talked about spirituality, which was a new topic for me. You know, it, it we had talked about it when I was younger, but I really um, didn't get into it. And that then led me to the Ruth Montgomery books. And Ruth Montgomery was a woman who wrote many books uh, via automatic writing. And that really, really interested me. I said, wow, you know, if I knew how to do automatic writing, I could figure out where this makeup sponge came from. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> You know, I could talk to the spirits and find out, you know, what they're trying to tell me. And lo and behold, at that time, a friend of mine uh, says to me, hey, I'm going to go to a meeting tonight. Would you like to come with me? And I went, sure. You know, I had nothing else to do. And it was about transcendental meditation. And I was not a very spiritual person. I, I definitely wasn't into meditation. And I sat through the whole presentation rolling my eyes. Um, this is not for me. I was a very, I was a very uh, corporate person at the time, a uh, very straight up corporate person, um, and and meditation was not not part of my life at the time. And I went to the meeting, and uh, my friend said to me, "Let's sign up, you know, and just learn how to do this." And I said, "Okay, you know, just to to please them." And when I got to the meeting, they, they taught us how to do the OM and, and relax. And and instead of meditating, my head started going around in circles, which is really strange. And um, and I felt like my whole soul was leaving me through my feet. And, and I thought that was really weird. So I, I looked around, I opened my eyes, and no one else seemed to have their head spinning. You know, <laughs> I was the only one that had these weird things happening. So um, I said, this is not for me, but let me, let me go home. I'm going to try it maybe in the, in the comfort of my own home. So when I got to, the, to my uh, room, I put out a pad of paper on my lap and a pen, and I said, let me try the meditation technique that I just learned. And let me just hold my pen here. Maybe I could do the Ruth Montgomery thing. And I didn't think it was going to work, but as I was there uh, um, just meditating, just relaxing, my hand started moving. And it was going crazy. It was, uh, you know, it was all over the paper. 
And um, I was kind of scared. I was spooked. It was like, what is this moving my hand? <laughs> and I was afraid to open my eyes. And so finally I opened them, and it had all over the paper in Spanish, it said, Yo soy tu padre. Yo soy tu padre. Yo soy tu padre. Which means, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little uh, touched here. It said, I'm, I am your father. Oh. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm almost crying. So my mm-hmm. dad had communicated with me at the time, and I went, wow, you know, this is really great. So um, I ran into my mom's room. It was like 11 o'clock at night, and I woke her up, and I said, dad communicated with me, you know, and this is what mm-hmm. I did. And she was very, <laughs> you know. and uh, How did she take the, that? She, it was like normal. She took it like, okay, you learned a new thing. <laughs> And in the morning, I explained to her, I explained to her, you know, Mom, this is all I did. I relaxed. I put the pad down. I put the pen. I asked for some sort of communication. And Dad came through, and I went to work, right? So when I get home that afternoon, my mom says, guess what? (laughs) I communicated with your dad today. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) And I said, that's no fair. I had to pay $300 for my session. (laughs) Oh, that's hilarious. (laughs) Alba, how long had it been since your father had passed? My dad had passed nine years before. And that's when I found out. My dad was a prankster. And my dad loved to play tricks on people. And that's how I found out that it was my dad. I asked him. I said, was that you? And he goes, of course it was me. You know, because he liked to play jokes on people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, so... Both my mom and I were communicating with him. Then my sister joined in, and and she started uh, also doing automatic writing. So all of us were communicating with him. And uh, I found out, you know, how he passed and what happened after he he went to the other side. And it was a really beautiful experience. And, um, you know, I got to know a lot about spirituality from my dad. Mm -hmm. But then after a while... Um, we kind of ran out of things to talk about, you know, because my dad told me that he had to he, he had to go to school. He told me I have to go to school, and I and I kept thinking school, you know, you you don't have a body. <laughs> what, what are you talking about school? And he goes, I have classes that I have to go to, and I didn't know at that time that yeah, you do go to classes. So mm-hmm. he says, you know, I um I'm gonna let you talk to your guide now, and he'll he'll answer all your questions. So I spent many years then communicating with my guides. And my guide was like my best friend. Anytime I had a question or I had um, any problem, I would start writing. And my guide told me, you know, well, you know, he, he, he kind of comforted me. Um, mm-hmm. he, he didn't tell me what to do. He just comforted me and would tell me things are going to be okay, you know. And it was like having someone to just talk to that would answer my questions. But I found out a lot about spirituality through him. And um, so that's how I became, uh, that's how I did the automatic writing. And, and throughout the years, the it, it began to increase more and more to where I started getting guides that were master teachers that would really teach me things that I never even knew existed. And they always told me, they always told me, we are preparing you. You're a messenger of hope, and we are preparing you for something really big. And I kept saying, well, you know, why me? Why did you pick me? You know. And they said, you, you agree to this. And they said, one day you're going to be um, meeting with people face-to-face. You're going to be helping them, and we are preparing you. And wow. it's been a long journey. <laughs> it's been a really long journey. So, you know, this has been going on for years and years. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's why I started the coaching uh, business where I said, you know, I, I've been told that I need to, uh, the lessons that I'm learning, I need to tell other people about it. So I started coaching people. And again, they mm-hmm. were telling me, um, you're not going to be able to do this over the phone. You have to do it in person. You're going to be sitting across yeah. from someone and doing it. And we're talking about them telling me this back in 2007. And I had no idea that I would be getting into QHHT. Um, mm-hmm. And and the reason I got into it was that um, 
even though coaching was really exciting and I enjoyed it, I, I felt that I felt that I was not being uh, honest with my clients because I I didn't tell them where I was getting the information from. You know, I just you know <laughs> sounded like a very wise person. But what was happening is during my coaching sessions, I was channeling. And I never really revealed my spiritual side to them. I, you know, I was you always the corporate person. You see, I was always corporate and, and uh, didn't think that people would understand about my automatic writing or, or my spirituality. And so I kind of kept, kept that hidden for many, many years until finally it, it had to come out. And it did. So... That's kind of and like so that's how a you, long story. That, that's how you ended up finding out about Dolores and QHHT? I mean, how, how did no, you no. get into one okay. of her classes? <laughs> <laughs> it's still, it's a long story. <laughs> are, you, are you ready for this? Sure. Everybody yeah. likes stories about Dolores and how people found okay. her and how they got into well, this work. It's, it's why we're here. It was, it was really a strange, strange way uh, that I got through this. Um, back in 2009, uh, we had a, a really strange thing happen to our family, and uh, really strange. My, my son was arrested for something he didn't do, and um, that became international news. It was a really, really hard thing to go through. And wow. during the during the arrest, well, he wasn't arrested in the house. He was arrested somewhere else. But during the um, search in my house, part of the evidence that they took were my automatic writings. You're kidding. And <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, wow. They they took my automatic writing, and I had been keeping those a secret forever, and um, I didn't think people were ready for. For, for that information, so I kept them a secret. And during the search where they took everything that was important to us, um, they took my automatic writing, and I had to, for the first time in public, tell someone that I did this. I had to tell his attorney that, listen, you know, now the public, um, the public has this. This is you know, it's going to be used, you know, against me because I wrote something in in my journals about why he was arrested, you know, the, the, the whole idea of why he was arrested. And it was going to come up, and I was afraid of that. And that was the first time I actually had to go public with, with the fact that I did automatic writing. And um, I kept begging, you know, my attorney to please try to get these back because first of all, they were they were not only my automatic writings, but they were my journals, my diary, um, my notes on anything that I did as far as coaching. You know, it was everything that I ever wrote they had. And um it was it was really amazing. So um that was a hard pill to swallow. And throughout the Well I guess time, that's <laughs> that's really personal yeah. stuff. I mean, that's amazingly it was very personal. personal. So, yeah, so I was dealing with the fact that my son was arrested and um, vilified by the media um, for something he didn't do, and it was international news. And at the same time, I had I had this to deal with too, which was my own personal stuff. And months went by, and I begged my attorney to try to get them back. And they said, no, uh, actually, they've been purchased by the local newspaper. And now the not only do the attorneys have it, but our local newspaper reporter has it. And they're reading your journal. It, did, and, you say per, <laughs> did you say purchased? They had purchased it, yes. They were public record. My, 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 uh, all my stuff became public record. So they actually purchased wow. it. Yeah, so um, here I was now dealing with this issue with my son and dealing with the fact that now my entire life was being read by every attorney, the state attorney's office, and our local newspaper reporter. And they were trying to look for stuff in there to use against my son. 
And um, I kept doing my automatic writing, and, and my guides kept telling me, don't worry about it. This is exactly what's supposed to happen. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> of, course, of course it was. <laughs> what, are you nuts? I'm dying here, you know. It was it was like a knife going through me. And they said, no, the people who are reading your automatic writing are supposed to be reading them. And I said, that's personal. You know, this stuff is personal. You mm-hmm. wrote it to me. You didn't read it yeah. for everybody in the world to read. And, yeah. um, you know, I, it put me in the hospital twice. You know, I was under major, major uh, stress. And mm-hmm. my guides kept telling me, keep writing, keep writing, because um, we have a lot to tell you. And I kept saying, yeah, but I want my journals back. You know, those are private. Why are people reading this? And they said, they kept saying, they're supposed to read it. They're supposed to read it. We are all one, and whatever you go through, everybody goes through. And that was really hard for me, you know, to realize mm-hmm. that. So, the, so, you know, my guides kept telling me, you must forgive them. You must forgive them. That's the only way. And I kept saying, you know, it's, it's impossible. How am I going to forgive? Because this is such a hard thing to forgive. I'm dealing with, um, you know, thousands of people, uh, you know, saying that my son is guilty, and now at the same time I'm dealing with this. You know, how can I forgive anybody for doing this to us? And my guides kept saying, you must forgive. You must forgive them. So um, finally I was able to forgive um forgive them for not knowing any better, okay? When you forgive someone, you don't forgive the event, but you forgive the person so that you can stop hurting. Mm -hmm. And that was a major, major lesson for me, was that Mm -hmm. it was, you can never change the event, but you can stop hurting inside by, you know, by forgiving them. You know, they didn't know Mm -hmm. any better. And they kept telling me, put yourself in their shoes. They didn't know. Mm -hmm. They didn't know. So um, you you must forgive. And, boy, it took me months and months and months until finally I did forgive them. And um, it felt like a big load was off of me. But I still had PTSD. You know, I, I was still suffering from PTSD because it was a major issue that had happened. And um, Mm -hmm. that's where I was. And so my son's uh, case ended up falling apart. They they realized that uh, he didn't do what they said that he did. He was exonerated. He left for college. And I said, okay, now I have to start my, my life again. I have, you know, now I've forgiven them. This is behind me now. I got to do something to change my life. So I got into kickboxing. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, okay. what what better way? What better way to get all of that anger that I still had <laughs> that t- that wasn't gone from the forgiveness? What better way was it to punch it out, you know, and kick it out? So I got into kickboxing, and wow. every mm-hmm. time I would go to kickboxing, I would just punch and punch and punch the bag and kick it. And I finally got all of the anger out, and I felt like I had healed myself. You know, it, it was a, an amazing, amazing thing that I went through. So mm-hmm. um, I was doing the kickboxing, and all of a sudden, I got tendonitis, and I couldn't do my punching. I couldn't do my push-ups. I couldn't do anything in kickboxing because I had this severe tendonitis. And I kept saying to myself, I've got to get back to the gym because I really enjoy it. Well, when I said that, I hurt my knee, okay? And now I had tendonitis, and my knee was out of whack. And I kept saying, well, when I fix the tendonitis in the knee, I'm going to go back to the gym. And I tripped over my dog, sprained my wrist, (laughs) and broke my toe. (laughs) Okay, Alba, did, Alba, I have to ask you, which side of your body? Did you do this all on one side of your body or both sides? No, it was it was, it was was first started on the right and then it was the left. So, yeah, I, I, I understand where you're going with this. So 
here I am icing all of this, and I said, you guys are going to kill me. What are you trying to tell me? You know? And Mm -hmm. I said, so I'm icing everything, and I pulled up my laptop, and I discovered Dolores. (laughs) Oh, so, oh, you got got (laughs) smacked down into your chair so that you could do some (laughs) surfing. Surfing, some serious surfing. And once I saw that, I went, oh, my God, you guys almost killed me just to get my attention. And I could hear them laughing, you know. (laughs) I could hear them laughing, and I said, this is Mm -hmm. what you wanted me to see. And I went, this is exactly what I was looking for. This not Mm -hmm. only deals with my automatic writing, because I've already been in touch with my guides. Mm -hmm. This helps with my coaching because I'll be coaching people before I even, you know, put them in trance. Mm -hmm. And everything that I ever was looking for was exactly what QHHT was going to give me. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't even... I don't think I had even finished my ice bag yet. <laughs> I had already ordered <laughs> all of the books. <laughs> I, had, I had ordered the books that were the prerequisites for the course, and um, I had ordered the course already. And during um, during New Year's Eve, starting 2014, I was I was listening to my course online, listening to Dolores. And on another screen, I was putting together my website for QHHT. <laughs> so as soon as I got my, um, I finished with the test and I knew that I had passed my test, I launched my website. Wow, Alba, you know, I, it seems like I've known you for longer and that you've been practicing for much longer than that this you know it's kind of amazing that um i would not have guessed that i would have thought that you've been around a little longer than that <laughs> it, it seems you just like went it. right and the, and, the, yeah. and the funny thing is is i, I only do my my uh qhht on the weekends because i have a full-time job mm-hmm. but i pack so many sessions into a weekend and mm-hmm. I get so involved with them that I feel like I have been doing this for years and years and years. Um, well, you're you well, you're very prolific, and there's so many sessions that we want to talk about tonight. But why don't we start um, a little bit with your history of Halloween because that's that's why you're here. You you posted that's a session right. on. Uh, on the forum, and when I say the forum, um, Dolores Cannon's original support forum, we we share session um, stories and tidbits and things that happen, um, the practitioners of her method, and she posted a story about a haunted house, and then (laughs) when I was talking to her a little bit about it, she was telling me about how she'd always decorated for Halloween, and then that's when I said, well, this is perfect. You're going to have to come on and tell us about (laughs) all of that. And the things that you learn and about um, about this session, uh, amongst others. So, but why don't you start with how you came to be that amazing person in the neighborhood who decorated up their house like that? <laughs> the and, Halloween and queen thrilled, yeah, thrilled all the children, and and uh, you really you really went, made quite a production every year. How did you get started uh, in that? Well, when I was younger, I loved Halloween. It was great. We we grew up in I grew up in the '60s, and Halloween was going out trick or treating. And my mother was a seamstress, and she would sew my outfits. And we were very creative. I I loved the creativity of Halloween. I loved the fact mm-hmm. that you can say, you know, how the kids say, you know, what are you going to be for Halloween? It's it's <laughs> always what are you going to be? It's it's creativity, right? Yeah. So when my son was born, I had heard in the neighborhood, there was, you know, those whisperings in the neighborhood saying, you know, there's a bunch of people that are trying to get rid of Halloween in this neighborhood. They would prefer that the kids go to the mall. And my yeah. son was tiny. And I went, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You know, you can't make him miss out on Halloween. 
And he was tiny. Mm-hmm. He, was, he wasn't even two years old yet. And so I said, you know what? If you build it, they will come. Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? So what I did is I had seen uh, several years before someone who had put tombstones in their yard, and it attracted a lot of kids. So I went mm-hmm. out and I got these big uh, styrofoam boards and just cut them out into, uh, you know, little uh, put circles on the top to where it, the shape of a tombstone, and I made one with a cross, mm-hmm. and, and I, I wrote funny epitaphs that I had seen at Disney World. And um, that was it. And, boy, the kids mm-hmm. loved them. And I, we got mm-hmm. a lot of trick-or-treaters that year. So in the next year, I said, you know, I'm going to make three more and grow the, the, the cemetery. And this time <laughs> I'm going to put, like, maybe props in front of it. Like, I'll put, like, a heart, and I put, like, a, a mask in front of it, and I'm just going to make it spookier, you know. So then my my family started getting involved, and we would dress up and go into the into our yard and pose as if we were monsters. So we wouldn't mm-hmm. move. So we, we we wanted the people to wonder if we were real or not. And when they had let down their guard, we would scare them. <laughs> you know, they'd say, like, oh, I don't think she's real. No, I don't think she's real. And, uh-huh. like a boop, you know, and then they'd freak. And it became really exciting. You know, we felt like we were empowered now. You know, we can really scare people. So it mm-hmm. became an obsession. Every year I did three more tombstones, more props and my son grew up with Halloween being a production it was a theatrical production so Mm -hmm. I kept adding more and more and then my husband um would have skits in in our in our um garage like one year was a mad scientist and we put strobe lights and body parts and another year it was a cave and with a two-way mirror inside and people would go in and get scared with the mask on the other side. We, we started really getting into this production every year of of calling in these kids and mm-hmm. they would bust them to our house. So when we wow. moved to, well, yeah, when we moved to a bigger house, the reason at the house was because it had a great yard for a cemetery. and the realtor said please don't tell that to the owners of the house because they're very (laughs) religious and they would freak out oh my gosh so i started creating uh this really big production um we had a wraparound porch and a really huge yard and what i would do is i would close off the porch one side had curtains that were black and the other side had curtains that were white, and we would do like a a mad scientist type of thing in in one part of the of of the porch, and people would walk through the porch and go through different scenes. Uh, we'd had strobe lights, we had really scary music, 